Good morning. You ever seen one of these before? Can you see it? If you've been to a sporting event, or you've watched a sporting event on television, uh, maybe you've seen this behind uh, the hoop uh, at a basketball game, or you've seen it behind uh, the field goal posts at a football game, or I don't know where they put it at a hockey game, but... John 3.16, right? The gospel in a nutshell. And when somebody holds up this sign at one of those sporting events, it's meant to be a gentle form of evangelism, isn't it? It's meant to communicate the gospel in a nutshell. You can imagine someone who doesn't know what John 3.16 saying, hey, what is that? What is that sign all about? I don't know if you could really count on someone who's unfamiliar with Christianity to actually grab a Bible off the shelf and that they would know enough Bible anymore to be able to find the Gospel of John as opposed to one of the letters of John and know how to find chapters and verses. That might be a pretty tall expectation for folks nowadays, but maybe you could imagine that when the person, the person who is not Christian, says, what is that all about? Maybe it would be a gentle way of spurring a usually quiet Christian to respond to their question, oh, I happen to know what that means. God so loved the world that God gave God's only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Sometimes when I see this sign at sporting events and I imagine that exchange is happening between a non-believer and a believer, this communication of the gospel in a nutshell, I wonder sometimes if a non-believer says, so what happens if you don't believe in Jesus? Uh oh, then you've put our normally quiet Christian into an uncomfortable situation, haven't you? Unless you are a fire and brimstone kind of Christian, you will find it very difficult to try to say to your friend who's with you watching sporting events, well, if you don't believe in Jesus, then you're going to burn in hell forever. <laughs> That's why I wish that folks would start to make their sign not just John 3.16, but John 3.16 and 17. It's so important for us, brothers and sisters, to hold uh, the little caveat that the Gospel of John puts into Jesus' mouth with this Gospel in the nutshell. John 3.17 says, because God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world. Jesus' coming isn't a new way of creating a new system of condemnation, if you think that's how Christianity works, you are not actually practicing Christianity. Instead, John 3.17 says, God didn't send him to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved, might be enlightened. So it's important to hold a little caveat uh, whenever you see John 3.16. It's not setting up a new system of condemnation. It's setting up a new system of mercy for everyone. The other weird thing when I see this sign is that if you read this scripture in its context, it's not meant for non-believers. It's meant for religious people, presumably religious people like you and me, not the non-believer. And there's a story that goes with the verse that helps to illustrate what I'm trying to communicate this morning. Uh, and uh, it's about a guy named Nick, Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus is identified in the Gospel of John as a really highfalutin fancy religious guy, a Pharisee and identified as a leader among the Judeans uh, down in the south country of the Promised Land. And Nicodemus, 
uh, decides that he's got to check some things with this country bumpkin preacher from the north, from Galilee, this Yeshua, Jesus. And so uh, Nick goes to ask some questions, but he goes under cover of night. And in the Gospel of John, whenever something is happening at night, it's meant to indicate that the person who is acting at night uh, is somehow not totally with it spiritually. Something's not clicking for them. And a matter of fact, they could even be an agent of the darkness. We'll give Nick the benefit of the doubt. He comes after having seen some of the early miracles that Jesus has performed down in the burbs of Jerusalem. And he says, Rabbi, which is a nice thing to say. You think of this very fancy Pharisee who had executes a huge amount of power there in the South Country, addressing this backcountry preacher as rabbi, that's, that's a good start. So we sense that he's not one of the bad guys. Rabbi, we know that you have to have some kind of coziness with God because no one would be able to do the things that you've been doing apart from God. And... I think to myself, oh, good religious Nick, why are you afraid of your questions? Why must you hide your struggles and only speak them by candlelight in the night? That might be my first beef in Jesus' name with us, with us religious people, uh, those of us who are professional Nicodemus and those of us who are armchair Nicodemus, uh, that we somehow think being a person of faith and being a follower of Jesus means that we don't have any questions anymore, means that we've got all the answers. Uh, and any time anyone says anything that threatens our sense of security in those answers, boy, do our hackles go up, don't they? And then we commit that gravest of all evangelism sins, and we say to the person who is asking their own heartfelt questions that sound too much like the questions that we hide in our own hearts, we say, well, you just have to take it on faith. For the love of Jesus Christ, people, don't tell someone when they're asking you a question that you just have to take it on faith. Don't shame them into hiding their struggles or your struggles in the night, whispering them alone to Jesus. Share what you're going through. Share your struggles with one another. Jesus is big enough, strong enough, risen enough that there is nothing that you can ask that could possibly sabotage his divine reign. Have a member of our congregation who is passed into glory. And he once came to me and said, Pastor Ryan, I want to check something with you. Uh, and uh, I, I don't mean to be a heretic, but I might be. I don't know. And he said, when we say the Apostles' Creed, or the Nicene Creed, I don't know that I actually believe in the resurrection of the body. Part of me thinks that instead of a physical resurrection, our spiritual souls go up to heaven and live in that divine realm with God forever. We're still us, and maybe there's a sense of physicality, but it's not about an end-of-time resurrection. And so I feel uncomfortable saying that particular line of the creed. And I'm wondering, Ryan, can I still think of myself as a Christian if I can't get in line with that particular line? And I said, well, my goodness, man. I mean, first of all, God bless you 
Uh, you are entering into a struggle that has existed for us followers of Jesus for 2,000 years. You are not alone in your questions, and your doubts do not disqualify you. There are people all over planet Earth that think about Jesus in a bazillion different ways, and he is still able to speak to them and speak through them, and ultimately we will know what the answers are, but it's going to take a long time. So you should know that here at Ascension, if we are going to practice the Lord welcomes everyone, that means the Lord welcomes them with all of their doubts and questions and curiosities too. So if you are someone in your wilderness journey and you've got some of those, don't hide them. Please share them. Wonder out loud. Let us join in the conversation. And if you hear someone share something like that, please Please resist the temptation to finger wag, even though I'm finger wagging at you now. Please, please don't make them feel bad for being on a journey in their friendship with Jesus Christ. Uh, that's, that's the first thing I get from the story of Nick uh, coming under cover of night to ask Jesus, whom he thinks is probably a pretty special guy somehow, his hard questions. Then my next favorite part is uh, that they enter into some really heady uh, theological dialogue. Jesus seems to pay Nick a kind of compliment when Nick says, I know that you have to be somehow in touch with God because apart from God somebody couldn't be doing the amazing things that you are up to. And Jesus says, Truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born from above. Well, um, I think in my reading of that story, Jesus is trying to pay Nick a compliment to say, good for you, Nicodemus, you, you're on your way. You understand something special going on, and, and I know that it is God, God's own self, that is, that is giving that to you. Great. But instead of receiving the compliment from Jesus, Nick gets confused. Nick says, well, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense theologically. Uh, part of the confusion comes from the fact that the word that we uh, can translate as uh, again or from above is the same word. So you could read it as uh, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. And in American religion, we've preferred that translation uh, because it's meant that we've been able to baptize more people. We like that. Um, but it can also be translated as from above. Nicodemus thinks that Jesus is saying you have to be actually born again. And he says, how y'all, Jesus, how are you going to climb back into your mother's womb? That, none of that even makes any kind of sense. Uh, and the conversation just uh, unravels from there, and it eventually gets to the point where Jesus is just laying the most incredibly uh, complicated theology on Nicodemus. Uh, so here's what Here's the second thing I get. Uh, not only should we as followers of Jesus be open about our questions, but we have to know that the first place we're going to find our answers is in and through Jesus. The first place you're going to find answers is in and through Jesus. So I can't believe I'm going to say this, because normally I tease people. If, if you stopped your faith journey after confirmation, I usually tease you and say there's so much more to the adventure than just graduating from church when you're a teenager. Uh, but today, I can actually say to you that the Sunday school answer in this situation is the right answer. If you've ever seen a children's sermon, it doesn't matter what the pastor, pastor asks the children, the children will answer, Jesus, right? There's a funny story. Uh, it's, it has nothing to do with my sermon, but I'll tell you anyway. Uh, there's a funny story about a pastor who's giving an Easter sermon, 
Some of you may have heard this before, and the kids are all gathered. And, uh, we're here to celebrate Easter kids. Can anybody tell me what Easter is about? First kid raises his hand, gets the microphone, which is always exciting. Uh, and um, Easter is when you buy chocolates and cards uh, for the people you love, uh, and, uh, and there's lots of hearts, and it's, uh, it's a big celebration of love pastor in consternation says, well, no, that's, uh, that's Valentine's Day. Does anybody else know what Easter is? Oh, yes, Easter is, uh, Easter is when we put up a tree and we exchange gifts and we sing Silent Night. Oh, my goodness, the pastor realizes my entire ministry has been a total failure. Um, and no, that's, that's not quite right. Finally, he gets to the, the, one of the kids and says, kid says, um, Easter is when uh, Jesus... Uh, after he's been killed on the cross, uh, comes out of the tomb. That's Easter Day. And the pastor is so relieved and thrilled, but the, the little kid keeps talking while he has the microphone, and he says, and uh, if he sees his shadow, then you know there's six more weeks of winter. That has nothing to do with my sermon. Uh, it's just a great story, and as someone who is trying to Christianize his spawn, uh, I can appreciate the difficulty of doing that. So, um, Jesus is, uh, it is in Jesus and through Jesus that we find our initial answers. Um, it's, it's not about studying scripture more in and of itself. It's not about becoming some really amazing theologian. It's not becoming some sort of super Christian that has pulled herself or himself up by his bootstraps. Instead, whatever questions or curiosities or doubts we may have, we should take them to him, trusting that just as he did with Thomas on the second Sunday after Easter in the evening, just as he does with Nicodemus, he will begin to provide the answers, but those answers are to be found in him. And when you take those questions and curiosities to him, he may say, does it matter? Are you wasting your time on things that don't matter in the end? Are you answering my call to join the family business instead of getting up hung up on theological minutia or biblical trivia. Instead, come watch what I do. See me lifted up and then join me in the practice of that timeless life. Because it's not, at least according to the Gospel of John, it's not about getting to heaven. It's about living heaven here and now. Wouldn't that be amazing? If you went out into this heavenly afternoon and lived the timeless life, eternal life, because you've taken your questions and your curiosities and your doubts to Jesus, and he's taught you the answer in himself. That could be yours. It could be yours today. Amen.